Good evening, this is Christian. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm uh, here this evening to talk to you about an interesting street. That's my uh, face, by the way, if you don't already know me. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure if I'm getting this done right. Uh, that's why I'm a bit hesitant. It seems to have changed some rules. I'm ta here to talk to you about a, uh, a street downtown which uh, you probably have seen or passed and thought nothing of it. But it's actually a pretty amazing street. So you, it's called Torrance Street. Torrance. T-O-R-R-A-N-C-E. And if you know Mountain and uh, St. Antoine, which is what I'm showing you on Google Street View, it's, uh, of course, it's huge now. It's the, the Bell Center is right at this corner. Mountain and St. Antoine is a famous... Uh, street famous for having a lot of black people uh, living down there as there were a couple of train stations and they were working as porters so this was a rocking corner in fact it was called the corner that's what the black people were calling it blacks of Montreal the English black community which is actually quite uh, numerically small but culturally important so if you get to the corner of Mountain and um, St. Antoine you go farther down the, this little stretch here had a bar called uh, Cafe St. Michel at the corner. or near, Not the, quite the corner, but halfway down the block right here, what you're looking at. And Cafe St. Michel was a legendary place, really important place in Montreal history. And of course, wow, I didn't even see this building. This was an empty lot for about 50 years or whatever, and prior to that it was Rockhead's Paradise, another... Um, black bar full of jazz musicians and all sorts of stuff really lively stuff this was an amazing corner it's before my time that it was amazing but I've studied the history of it and I always wanted to know specifically about this street called Torrance now if you know Montreal all of the best streets the coolest little streets are these little east-west streets uh, you know we all know you know sure you know Peel and St. Lawrence and St. Denis all these north-south streets are all emblazoned into our minds, as are the uh, the east-west streets, which are basically, you know, your, you got your Sherbrooke de Maisonneuve, Dorchester, St. Antoine, St. James, uh, Notre Dame, etc. But then they got these little weird streets, like I lived for many years on a tiny street called Concora, it was, uh, it's now uh, disappeared, and uh, there's, uh, you know, quite a lot of them, and they're always really quite fascinating. So I'm going to tell you about the history of this particular street by, oh, this is an amazing view of it. Look at that. This is the 1947 aerial view of, right here will be, um, I don't know if you could see my cursor there. That's the corner of uh, Mountain and St. Antoine, right? Okay, so this thing here, if you could see my cursor moving, that is Torrance. Now what's interesting, okay, uh, I don't know what the, this structure would have been, but I know that there was once a church at the corner of Mountain and Torrance. Okay, so maybe that's an old church building or something else. <clears throat> now, on the bottom here, you have what was called the St. Antoine Market. And this train station was the Bonaventure train station. I'm seeing that it was opened in 1877. So um, this bridge oh that is it no longer exists all right that bridge was the only way to get over the um the railway tracks okay so there was a bridge at mountain and another at guy and a tunnel at atwater so if you wanted to go south of montreal beyond uh you know beyond the tracks over to to whatever griffin town or wherever you had to take one of these uh these routes and uh they're, they're kind of cool these these bridges hold on i think i have a picture of these bridges. Okay, so this would be one old photo of that bridge on mountain. And, um, oops, what did I just do? Uh, there's another old photo. I, I can't tell you right away the year. I'd have to look it up. But that's the what you, you would uh, have had on the corner of St. Antoine. So I'm going to come back to this. So y you had um, the Bonavent. This little tiny street here was called Bonaventure Street. And I believe that's why the Bonaventure train station was called the Bonaventure just because of this street. There was a little market here called the St. Antoine Market. So uh, this sort of had a name, but then it was just 
called St. James. So I believe the address is here where St. Saint James or St. Jacques is there, they call it. Uh, basically, um, so this, uh, this street here was a kind of an equivalent to Torrance. Now, what is interesting, the building that kind of interests me most about Torrance is on the north side here, this one with the big fat roof. Now, I, I suspect that this was a part of the old mansion that once uh, was known in the area. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that in a second. So, uh, mountain oh, for one block over to, I guess it was called Aqueduct, and now it's called Lucien Lallier, which is basically Crescent Street, Crescent south of Dorchester. So, um, it's called uh, Lucien Lallier. And so, basically, this street, Torrance, is only about 350 feet long. But as you can see, it was... Uh, it was crowded. There was a lot of places, and I believe some of these places are quite big. So a lot of doors in these places. Now, before I switch out of this, I just wanted to point out that I guess this is called a Little Burgundy now, and it's kind of known as a uh, a black neighborhood. And uh, it, uh, well, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it was uh, the, well, a lot of the train porters, not only from the uh, from the uh, Bonaventure station, uh, but also from the nearby Windsor station. So a lot of black, th th that's where the black uh, men were getting their, their work as trained porters. And uh, so they lived nearby in this area. And uh, the thing I wanted to mention, which I find really quite incredible, is that this area was mostly called St. Ant Saint Antoine Street area back then. It wasn't really called Little Burgundy. Uh, until like the 60s, I believe. And uh, some of the great Irish crime clans grew up in this area. So it re was really a hotbed of crime. You had uh, the, the Maguires, the Johnstons, the Ashtons, and many other, uh, you know, splashy, high high um, profile criminals. So I'm going to, you see, once again, I'm going to come back to this uh, this building, which intrigues me. Okay, so... Um, these are that's a picture of the Bonaventure train station, which um, obviously was a long. It was I, I don't know the year it was demolished. It was the fifties or sixties. But af, uh, the um, the railway tracks leading up to the station, uh, they were all obviously pulled up at the same time. But that underneath remained a uh, just a big muddy thing. So you'd walk over that bridge and you would just see mud underneath. That was all you'd see, and. Uh, they they eventually uh, got rid of the uh, they got rid of the bridge. So there's you just walk um, down mountain and you don't have to worry about any bridge anymore. Now what I find fascinating about this street Torrance is uh, it once had this magnificent mansion. It was called uh, Saint Antoine Hall. That was the name of the mansion. That was it was on Saint Antoine Street. But the back door would have been on Torrance. Okay, so who built this? Some guy named John Torrance, and uh, he was an interesting character because he uh, made a ton of money. I think he was sh involved in shipping and importing, and I believe he uh, had uh, tea coming into the city and made a, a ton of money on that. You don't really hear about John Torrance anymore. Uh, probably because he didn't really name anything after himself. He didn't endow uh, anything in particular. There's a, a beautiful picture of the John Torrance's uh, mansion that would have been uh, backing on to Torrance Street. Of course, there was no neighbors back then. This uh, I have the year somewhere. I believe it was built in 1818, and I couldn't find a date that it was demolished, but I believe I saw a reference in 1960 saying that it was modified. So I believe that it, the same mansion was used as, uh, you know, workers' housing, the, you know, uh, a working-class housing on uh, on Torrance Street. So that's the very same street that I showed you earlier, Torrance. It was, uh, it employed the um, the very building. So, I mean, John Torrance has, uh, had 10 kids and... Uh, he was from Scotland. He was a uh, Presbyterian, but he switched over to Methodism. So he was best known for having gardens. He would have, uh, you know, he'd invite people over to uh, to his garden festivals and stuff. So that was way early days. I mean, even the old timers don't really remember the Saint Antoine Hall. 
Okay. So I should mention as well, I wrote a little thing on this on Coolopolis. It was uh, John Torrance initially lived at uh, the corner of St. Lawrence and Sherbrooke. And um, that's a picture of the building. And what the heck is this? Oops, that's a very small picture. But you could see that uh, that is where the gas station at St. Lawrence and Sherbrooke now stands. And uh, this mansion was quite an interesting thing. Um, he got he moved out of it and moved on to St. Antoine Street and it was the Molson family who took that over and of course it's long long gone as I mentioned if you look on my page uh, on Coolopolis you'll see a long list of West End gang criminals and many of these guys had a uh, had a foothold in were from Little Burgundy slash the um, uh, the uh, St. Antoine Street area, around, right around Torrance. There's Johnny McGuire being one of them. I'm endlessly fascinated by these guys. So here's a map, okay? Uh, as you could see, Mountain Street. Once again, Mountain was an important street because if you wanted to uh, get in and out of the city, you would you would hop on uh, Mountain or downtown area to the south. You would, you would use Mountain. Okay, so what I did is I, uh, I simply went on to newspapers.com and searched Torrance Street. Okay, so uh, what I, I searched to the Montreal Gazette, and now they have the Montreal Star as well. So the um, the Montreal Star is a uh, a very cool addition, and so I can just by entering a Torrance Street, I can find every store thing that ever happened, pretty much that, was, that made it to print on Torrent uh, a Torrance Street. So here's a story about Torrance Street. A guy, <laughs> a taxi driver, uh, 52 years old, Henri Levesque. He was uh, driving. He, he was a ban He was, he was robbed and thrown in the trunk of his own taxi cab, and uh, it was it was left <laughs> on Torrance Street. By this point, 1969, Torrance was pretty much uh, an empty street. It had pretty much largely been demolished. Uh, if you look at the um, history of uh, demolitions in Montreal. They, were, they didn't ever really come out and say, we're going to do slum clearance. But uh, they certainly uh, demolished large sections of St. Henry, Little Burgundy, and uh, other places. So my hypothesis, which I'm eventually going to get to, is that the city was not particularly comfortable with uh, the antics of the people on Torrance Street, because even though it was just a about I don't know, a dozen houses, a, uh, maybe uh, you know, uh, it w it was certainly it came up in the crime sheets a lot. So this is a pretty funny story because I shouldn't say it's funny. A poor guy was locked in his trunk, but he's okay. He got robbed, and uh, it took them a while to um, to get him out of the trunk. So poor old Henri Levesque, he uh, he had quite an adventure on uh, the end of March, nineteen sixty nine. So I, I went through all of these last night, and uh, I was quite astounded at how many of these there are. There's a story about a guy named James G. Desmond, 63, of Torrance Street. This is uh, 1968. Now, there's a, a family uh, known as the Desmonds. Uh, I believe they were boxers, a black family, and uh, one of the, one of the uh, guys was quite well-loved. I'm for, forgetting his first name. George Desmond, I believe. And uh, he was involved in uh, various uh, stuff as well. But this one's named uh, James Desmond, and I would imagine he's related to George Desmond, who eventually got shot dead in a bar in Little Burgundy. Anyway, uh, like a couple of days after, there was a big roast for him. So it, the point was that he was both loved and hated insofar as they shot him, but they also loved him at a roast. Anyway, so this uh, story is about a guy who... Uh, who uh, hit a man with a bo over the head with a bottle, and he got two years in jail. Why? Because he had a lot of previous uh, convictions. So that um, uh, he he had lived on Torrance Street. This guy. Uh, so these old newspaper articles will give you the address of various criminals as well. So it um, it uh, kind of was a strange policy. Now, when the um, Cafe Saint Michel. Uh, 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 closed. Now, uh, the, the strange thing about this uh, black area of, of these bars is that the government simply closed them down. And uh, 
why it was never really made clear. In the case of um, Rockheads, it, he claimed that it was because he didn't bribe the right people. Cafe in Saint Michel, I believe, was closed for various reasons. They used to flout the uh, closing hour laws and stuff. So, you you had a a place down there after uh, called the Harlem Paradise. Now, the Harlem Paradise was a rocking place, and uh, the, there's a lot of uh, violent events on at the Harlem Paradise. I've written about this uh, several places. So, the Harlem Paradise on, uh, I guess it would be the the uh, east, sorry, the west side of Mountain Street, seven seven two Mountain. Here's a uh, a story about a very uh, a brutal fight right there, and uh, I guess the waitress was uh, living on Torrance Street, so which is basically just right around the corner. Now, um, let me see what else I've got here on Torrance Street. I've got uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a good one in a few minutes, but I, I you have to sit through uh, through these first because the, there's another one that's going to make you laugh in a few seconds from 1956. It's It gives you a really good sense of what this uh, street, this area, what the whole shape and feel of the place was about. So um, this is a sad one. They have a, uh, a man who was uh, strangled with his own shirt. It sounds like some sort of vagrant. You see these are abandoned places already in 1963. Uh, a victim was found dead in a abandoned house at 1348 Torrance. And uh, I, I don't know, it's just a sad story, of probably some sort of junkie who was strangled of, over something, but uh, they didn't know who it was. So uh, here's another one, uh, a bit spicy. Uh, a fellow was found dead, asphyxiated, strangled of some sort, Alf Albert Lefebvre, 38. His semi-nude body was found in a cupboard at 1350 Torrance Street last Saturday. So it sounds to me like, uh, what do you call it, erotic self-asphyxiation or whatever it's called. Uh, that's my speculation, but uh, of course we'll never know. Uh, I'm not that curious, to be quite honest. Uh, we got, uh, hold on a second, I've got a... This is a pretty spicy one as well, I believe. Um... Yeah. Oh, boy. Look what we got here. I was talking about Johnny McGuire, who was a, a, a very interesting member of the West End gang, a bit of a leader who I've written about extensively in a book I'm working on. Johnny McGuire was in a fight at the Harlem Paradise, and people were smashing each other over the head. And uh, there were witnesses. One of them lived on uh, on Torrance Street. These articles don't say, of course, and that, nor should they, whether someone was black or white, but it kind of makes it more interest it would make it more interesting if you knew uh, you know, what what these people were because uh just you can't really tell by the name. You know, it's it's always interesting to know what the uh the black community was doing because they're always just uh, an interesting bunch. So uh here's a story about uh, a guy, oh my gosh, Victor Simons, twenty years old he went to a party on Torrance Street in 1962. There's a couple of articles about this. And a janitor, <laughs> he he uh, went to tell him to turn the music down. And uh, so George, uh, so v Victor Simons set his dog to attack the janitor, but the dog actually didn't do any attacking at all. And uh, Simons got even angrier because people were making fun of him. They said, your dog is useless. So he went and smashed... Uh, this guy, the janitor, Georges Guy, 42, he beat him up very, very bad. So uh, Simons was also a pimp, it would appear. So uh, he was also facing charges of beating on women. So Simons was one of those old-style guys, I guess, who would be seen at the uh, Rockhead's Paradise in a, in a flashy suit and expensive, uh, you know, big big car so uh they were really like that back then by the way according to uh the descriptions i've been told um so uh let's see i'm going to scroll down a bit uh i ha i went through all of these yesterday these seem to be the same ones over and over i'm going to show you another story now uh which i think you'll quite enjoy this is really quite a fun story. Oops. Okay, so this is from the Petit Journal. And the Petit Journal was a, 
was a sort of a forgotten paper. Uh, so they went down to uh, Torrance Street in 1956, September 1956. I'm going to read this to you. Uh, it's uh, in French, but I'm gonna, just going to simultaneously translate. The black area of the city ha is, f uh, for the last six months, the rallying point of a, a prostitution network. The organizers are blacks, mostly from New York and some Montrealers. They have a blind pig, which is, of course, an after-hours bar, uh, which moves from place to place uh, depending on uh, the uh, circumstances. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, the blind pig moved from 1348 Torrance to 747 Aqueduct, which would be, of course, uh, Lucien Lallier. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, hold on a second. Let's see. Um, Oh, I'm also interested in this other story down here. Harry Percy. I just wrote about Harry Percy. Okay, pardon. Um, so uh, they're talking about uh, Torrance Street, and uh, they're saying that sort of things happen. The, the article gets sort of interesting. Hold on. The funny thing here is that uh, this photo of, of a staircase is like the only photo that I could find of a house on Torrance. It's like nobody has a photo of the place. It's crazy. So that whole neighborhood is not only forgotten, but it doesn't have a picture of it. And so you got your, um, you've got this this other one, 747 Aqueduct, which of course is long gone as well; it's demolished. So uh, these people uh, would come in from out of town or whatever, and um, they would, I guess, they would ask around, "Where are the hookers? Where can I have a party?" And uh, they would end up on Torrance Street. So. Uh, so there's a story. This this journalist actually uh, writes the license plate numbers of suspicious cars, and the <laughs> the paper published it, which is probably kind of not cool. But there was a Chinese restaurant nearby as well, which is referenced here called the Chow Main. I I would imagine. So yeah, it's uh it's on Mountain Street. So um, the Chow Main House. They uh they would hang out at the Chow Main House and sort of like meet with people who are looking for hookers or an, a late party. So the writer himself, who doesn't put his name on the article. Oh, no, I'm pardon, pardon me. He does actually, Pierre Léger. Pierre Léger, he, uh, he goes into one of the places. I guess it's in the middle of the night. And he says two black people, about 22 years old, uh, who uh, uh, they sat me down on a couch and they offered me a beer at $1.25 cents for the beer uh no he's talking about the price uh he's shocked that the fact that he has to pay so much uh so the prostitute named betsy from chicago asked him for twelve dollars and he claims that he doesn't have the money but who knows what he did in real life so uh that's his sort of ratting out this sort of crazy scene uh on torrent street and i, I don't know if this article, if this exposition on the vice in this particular area had any impact on its eventual demolition, but I do believe I would um, propose that, in fact, it did. So um, you had a couple of stories like this. There was uh, a story about a guy who was robbed on Torrance Street, and uh, he was a 31-year-old Chicago Okay, a 31-year-old Chicago man uh, was a killer. He um, he robbed a guy who, I believe in this story, had a heart attack and died. And there's a witness named Winnie Perla. She basically brought the guy down to Torrance Street in a taxi. So it sounds like Winnie Perla might have been a sex worker. And so she brought him down. She might have set him up because he... Uh, he ended up uh, being attacked and robbed, and uh, he died. So to what degree did he die of a heart attack or uh, or something else is another question. So there's another story. Now I'm having to go through these uh, of, a, uh, of a Polish guy who saved up his money, moved from Poland, and he, about, after about a year working in Montreal, bought a rooming house on Torrance Street. And uh, this is not the the article I'm looking at, but what happened is there were people upstairs 
making noise or something. So he went to c calm him down, and I believe he got pushed down the stairs, and uh, he died. So it was quite tragic because the uh, newspaper had earlier done photos of this guy for another story, and uh, there he was dead. So it kind of, uh, they hyped up the uh, the fact that this guy died by getting pushed down the stairs. Um, so here's a story about uh, two friends. This is back, this is crazy, back in the day. Two buddies, from they were friends since their youth. Gerald McIntyre, who lived on Torrance Street, and Gordon Griffith, 29, who lived on Guy, which is not very far. Like I said, they were friends since they were kids. Uh, they got into an argument because uh, Griffith came to a party with two women, and McIntyre started dancing with one of them. And uh, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh because this is sad, because uh, you're not supposed to do this in real life. What happened is uh, McIntyre was so irritated, he shot his friend a in, in blind rage. But the guy, the guy survived. So hey, all's well that ends well, right? Uh, he shot his friend o over a jealous party argument. Um, now, uh, one thing that kind of happens when you look through these stories, okay, I've got to go farther down, um, is that the, uh, the 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 tenor of them eventually changes. You find that. Uh, course it was a rocking street in the 50s and stuff but eventually you're going to see uh, a change and the older stories are about church services and of course the names of the people living on the street are quite different they're not uh, in other words it's not a um, not a, a, a quite the same in its earlier years as it was in its later years let's look at this one here Benjamin Park, 54, a native of Scotland who lived at 1329 Torrance, admitted that he stole $63. Oh, that's not a very interesting one. You see, that, that's the thing about modern media. They don't really write stories like that, you know? In a way, it's it's kind of better. The newspapers were, were much better back then, so it's sort of a strange anomaly. This is a bizarre story. A lady named Mrs. George Eccles. They don't actually give you her first name. They just call her by her husband's first name. 48 years old. She lived on Torrance. In actual, in actual fact, they had just she had just moved into an eight-room eight, uh, apartment on 1323 Torrance. Where well, do you see eight-room apartments nowadays? And uh, she had how many kids here? A lot of kids. Six kids. Uh, aged 12 to 5. So she's raising all these kids right downtown. And uh, the story is fairly banal in so far as they just had food poisoning and had to rush to the hospital, and I guess they were fine. But uh, um, just the, the, the background on what she was about uh, is quite, quite revealing. So we got, uh, oh, this is the story I was mentioning, a guy named Leon Januszewski in April 1955. He died when two guys, I guess, Lionel Springer and William Bradshaw, both 25, uh, they were originally charged with murder. It was they were having a noisy drinking party at the rooming house, and of course, uh, the uh, Polish uh, uh, janitor or owner, landlord, he went in to uh, get him to, to calm down. Ruth Ryan, 22, was acquitted. I believe something, somebody, to somebody who was there told me about that and I believe Charlie Chase the famous boxer was there as well because the Allo police ran a story on that same incident same incident and the the boxer uh uh the Charlie Chase who was a really fascinating character I've got him about him on my site he was around helping out the situation so uh Charlie Chase good old Charlie Chase um he, he uh, that's another story but obviously he lived down in that area he, Charlie Chase was once called the King of the Pimps. And the funny thing was that they kept on sending him to jail, but he'd get out and he'd return to boxing. And even though he was old, he'd win the title. He'd become the champion. And really nobody wanted him to become champion, I guess. But he kept on... Uh, here's a crazy story. You're not going to believe this one. Anybody who's watching now is going to say, well, I'm glad I held on for this. 
This is March 1955. Jacques Rock, a 25-year-old taxi driver, was acquitted yesterday on a charge of abducting an 8-year-old girl. I mean, what? Rock picked up Lise Raymond in his cab July 28 on Torrance Street. So he picked up a little girl and abandoned her four hours later in Shadowgate Village. So near a church where would she would be safe. So Rock told the judge that he loved children, was married, and he meant no harm, overwork and drink reduced him to a state where he didn't know what he was doing. Now this is the kind of crime that should land somebody in, I'm not really tough on crime, but that sounds like a pretty serious crime. Uh, it doesn't really make reference to whether the girl was like uh, sexually assaulted or anything, but uh, the judge bought it hook, line, and sinker. Armand Cloutier, he goes, uh, people's intelligence must be slipping. A lot of children are disappearing these days. Our parents are going to have to tie their children up to know where they are. Your act was that of an imbecile. So he gave the guy a tongue lashing, but he didn't give him any sentence for it. He just sort of, that's just a, it's the most insane thing I've ever seen. Guy kidnaps a little girl for four hours. Eh, no problem. Don't do it again. Uh, so uh, I don't think I saw this one. It's a story about a woman charged with trafficking narcotics. Back then, the drugs, I guess, were marijuana and Various types of amphetamines. Yeah, I guess there was a fringe heroin scene, but it wasn't very large. This actual article doesn't say what drug it was. And what amazes me is that cocaine was like not a thing. It was just not a thing. Just between about 1917 and 1973 or so, there was like no cocaine anywhere. There was just like, why didn't some gangster bring in cocaine? That to me is something I will never understand. Okay, so I can keep on going on these. You see, uh, a guy was robbed. He was living on Torrance, or he was robbed on Torrance. And you got a lot of those. And if you just keep on going farther and farther down, the com complexion of the neighborhood, the nature of what it was like, changes. So we're talking, these old newspapers really demonstrate that the a lot of people lived right downtown, you know, like, people with families and children and there was really the, the suburbs wasn't really like an option um, the, uh, the all the action was pretty much right near the downtown area uh, let me see this one here accosted by two Negroes one of them with a gun John Hill of 1381 Torrance was relieved of his pay envelope so that story wasn't wasn't shy to mention the uh, ethnicity of the uh, assailants. I suppose there was some sort of editorial meeting somewhere along the line that says, let's not do that anymore. Uh, I have mixed feelings about it because it certainly brings the story to life a little more, but of course it shouldn't, shouldn't really be something we think about. Uh, Ten-year-old assaulted in East End. Um, so, uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know what this one is. I've looked through the Montreal Star articles, but, uh, but I didn't look through the uh, the Gazette articles, so I can't just jump into those ones with, without uh, reading them first. <coughs> this one I should know. Um, hospital seeks friends of patient who died. Once again, it was just a, a random guy living on Torrance Street who, uh, who died, and they needed somebody to uh, identify him or something like that, 1940. So um, as you go on in time, the, uh, the stories thin out. So if you want to look at this street, Torrance, once again, I'm going to show it to you on the thing. This little, how many doors? One, two, three, and then this big one, plus all the ones on the south side. So we ha we're talking about a fairly densely populated street. I can't tell how tall these buildings were, but I'm assuming they were three stories. Uh, and... Uh, this um, would have been home to, what, a couple hundred people, a few hundred people, but also a very kind of booming strip right here on Mountain where there was restaurants and bars and all sorts of things. And you notice that several of the people were um, uh, who, li who worked in these bars were, uh, were living on this uh, little street. So I'm going to wrap this up by saying, you know, just uh, visualize this as a sort of like a, 
an image of Montreal's development over the years that we had a uh, a bucolic area with flowers, with uh, fields and meadows, and a, a rich guy with his beautiful mansion there. And uh, somewhere along the line, I believe I saw that it was about 1870 or 1890, you started having these uh, these other, you know, this more density, these other buildings being put up, these working class houses because people needed a place to stay. And uh, the area changed over the years. It was no longer a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, countryside with uh, flowers growing, but it was like the gritty urban sphere of all sorts of dynamic action and culture. Once again, you had a very interesting corner. If you could go back in time in Montreal, that would be one of the t places that you would want to be, would be uh, corner of St. Antoine and, uh, and uh, Mountain. You had a whole bunch of bars here. There was an excellent... Um, master's degree paper done by a McGill student, I believe in the 30s, talking about the bars there. One was called the Nemderlock, the Nemderlock, which means colored men, spelled backwards. So that colored men bar, he described this bar that was somewhere along St. Antoine, just east of a uh, mountain. There is no end to how fascinating this area was. And uh, it's, I'd have to say, it's kind of a shame to think that that what we saw, see there became what we see here. Absolutely nothing. What is this? It's a, a parking lot. I don't know who parks here. On the south side, it's uh, is there some sort of uh, industrial facility here? Uh, I'm not sure what what it's being used for or who owns it. But it's a uh, it's a shame. You know, it's a shame that uh, this couldn't have been preserved or, or you know kept alive and uh who knows maybe one day it will be brought back to life because of all the development down there but it will never be what it was which is an exciting dynamic action-packed street only 350 street feet long but just think of all of the per foot per square foot action that happened here over the ages it would be really uh, mind-blowing to go back in time Anyway, so uh, I'm going to close this down, and uh, I'm going to try to write something on my site, Coolopolis, about this, which I hope you could uh, have a look at eventually and uh, appreciate. Okay, uh, so I'm closing this up, and have a good night.